Let's continue talking about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And as we finish up talking about some causes of these problems, this time let's focus on how stereotypes distort perceptions and resist change. So although some stereotypes might be at least somewhat accurate, many are really just blatantly false, and many others are really just vast oversimplification. Well, that leads us to another cause of stereotyping prejudice and discrimination. It's the fact that stereotypes often distort our perceptions and they resist change even when they're clearly false. Let's talk about how that might happen and, and why that might happen. You might recall that we tend to seek, interpret, and create information that confirms our expectations. We talked about this previously. Let's say you have a stereotype that black men are violent and assume that you encounter two different headlines for some news stories. One headline says that a Black Lives Matters protest ended violently. And the other headline says that the Black Lives Matters protest ends peacefully. If you were to encounter these two different headlines, it's much more likely that you would seek out the information for the story about the Black Lives Matters protest ending violently because you're seeking out information that confirms your understanding of the world. Well, that's what confirmation bias was all about. Let's talk about another couple examples of confirmation bias and how that particular bias can distort our perceptions of information. In this particular study, research subjects were listening to a radio broadcast of a basketball game, and they were told to pay attention to a particular player. They obviously couldn't see the player, but they can hear about the player. Now, they were led to believe that the player might be white or black. When they were led to believe that the player might be black, Later on, they rated that player as having more ability and less in terms of court smarts, like an intelligence. But when they thought the player was white, they rated the player as having less ability, but more intelligence when it came to the court. This is pretty consistent with stereotypes, that black players tend to be very athletic, but not as smart, and that white players tend to be less athletic, but smart. Let me give you another example about how a confirmation bias can help distort information and even perpetuate stereotypes. You can see here there are two news stories. Both of these stories were written after Hurricane Katrina when there was serious flooding. In this first story, there was a picture, and the picture shows a relatively dark-complected person. And it says a young man walks through chest-deep flood water after looting a grocery store. So this person's leaving a grocery store with some items that he didn't pay for. Now, these people are also leaving a store, that same store, with some items that they didn't pay for. And these people, you can tell, are not as dark complected. And look at the way that this story was written. Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Do you see here how the information from this particular situation was interpreted in different ways based on the person who was involved? This person is seen to have been looting these people were simply finding food and water that, of course, they needed for survival. Let me give you another example. In this example, you'll see how people can even distort and manipulate information so that it's consistent with their existing stereotypes. This is a cartoon that comes from some research back from 1947 from Allport and Postman. It's really well known. In this little comic, you can see some people, it looks like they're on a train, and you see two people in the foreground, they're having what looks to be a discussion, maybe even an argument. There's a white man, and although it's tough to see, he has a blade, some type of a knife, and there's a black man right here, and he's, he's not armed with anything at all. Well, the way this worked was it was kind of like the telephone game, where one research subject would look at that, that situation and try to put a story behind it. And then that person would tell that story to the next person, and then that person would tell the story to the next person, and so on, and it would go through several iterations. What they found, and I found the same thing in my own classes, is about half the time, by the time that story gets to that last person, that blade has switched hands. So you can see in these situations, people sometimes manipulate the information so that the situation conforms to their existing beliefs about group stereotypes. So another factor that tends to lead stereotypes to distort our perceptions is the fact that we often overestimate how strongly variables are related. Naturally, we see patterns in data, and that's been very adaptive for us, so that we can predict one variable from another. However, sometimes there's very little relationship between two variables, or even no relationship, but we overestimate how strong that relationship is, and that leads to what we call an illusory correlation. 
So let me give you an example so you can see how this applies to stereotypes. Let's say that you have a stereotype that black men are violent, and when they protest, it tends to lead to violence. So you've encountered stories in the news that look like this, where there's a protest, there are black men involved, and here we can see it ended in violence. But it's possible that you're not looking at the entire realm of information fairly and really accounting for all the information. So for example, there are several protests that end in violence that involve white people. And of course, there are lots of protests throughout the years that have involved black protesters that have been completely nonviolent. And in fact, when you look at the civil rights era, most of those protesters were in fact nonviolent, but they were being attacked by police dogs or by the police themselves in their billy clubs. Now, both of these mental biases are strengthened by the fact that we tend to have better memory for stereotype consistent information. And that makes sense because stereotypic consistent information simply makes more sense to us because it confirms our sometimes potentially biased understanding of how the world works and of how people work. So you see, we're motivated to seek out and interpret information that confirms the beliefs that we already have. All right, let's continue to talk about how stereotypes can resist change. Stereotypes are likely to resist change if we can easily explain away inconsistency. Here's one way in which we might be able to do that. You'll recall from previous discussions that attributions are simply explanations about the causes of people's behaviors. So to what degree can we attribute the cause of someone's behavior to themselves and their personality? Or to what extent can we attribute the cause of someone's behavior to the power of the situation? So let's assume again that you have a relatively negative stereotype about blacks and that your stereotype includes that they might be intellectually inferior and less likely to be successful. In these situations, when they encounter failures, you're more likely to attribute the cause of that failure to the person. In other words, it's something about them. But now in situations when they encounter success, you're more likely to attribute the cause of that success to something about the situation, because it's certainly not something about them. For example, let's say that these two young black men have been admitted to Harvard and Yale, two great universities. Someone who has relatively racist beliefs might try to explain away their success by saying that they got admitted into those universities probably due to affirmative action. So if failures are due to the person and successes can be explained by the situation, you can see it doesn't leave much room for people to demonstrate their competence and it doesn't leave them much room to break out of anybody's stereotypic mold. In other words, they really can't win. Another way that stereotypes resist change is via subtyping. Subtyping allows people to create special categories that allow for exceptions to their stereotypes. So they don't need to scrap their stereotypes when they encounter some inconsistent information. They essentially create a special category. Let me give you an example. Let's say that someone has a relatively negative impression of blacks, and someone thinks that blacks could never be successful US presidents. And you say, how can you say that? Barack Obama was just the president for eight years, was voted into office twice, and people seem to like him. And that person might say to you, well, Barack Obama wasn't a typical black man. I mean, come on, think about the information about Barack Obama. Barack Obama's dad didn't even come from our country. He came from Kenya. And in fact, Barack Obama spent a lot of time in Kenya. He's clearly not a typical black man. And then they might go on to say that Barack Obama's mother wasn't even black. She was white. How can you say that Barack Obama was an ordinary black man? So you see, in this situation, the people are still able to hold their original stereotype that blacks could never be successful U.S. presidents because they're not categorizing Barack Obama as a black president. They're seeing him as an exception to the rule. He's a different type of black president. Well, these mental gymnastics help us keep our stereotypes alive, even in the face of stereotype inconsistent information. You see how dangerous this is? Even when we get information that completely counters our existing stereotype, we're not going to scrap that stereotype. We're going to go through some type of rationalization process so that we can maintain our current belief of the world while still accounting for those exceptions. Another factor that keeps stereotypes alive is automatic stereotype activation. The bottom line is that many stereotypes are very prominent in our culture. We know about them, we hear about them, and as such, they can be activated automatically and implicitly 
Remember, if we have some type of implicit bias, it means that we're not necessarily even aware of that bias. So my point is that these automatically activated stereotypes can influence our subsequent thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, even in people who are relatively low in prejudice, simply because we live in a culture in which we have these very prominent stereotypic beliefs. There are a variety of factors that can make us more or less likely to be influenced by automatic stereotype activation. One is just simply how well-known any given stereotype is in our society. The more well-known, the more prominent a stereotype is in our society, the more likely you are to be influenced by it. Another has to do with the person's self-esteem. You might recall that when people's self-esteem is threatened, we're more likely to derogate outgroup members. So in other words, when our self-esteem is threatened, we might be more likely to be influenced by stereotypes related to an outgroup member. Of course, another factor is simply how prejudiced is the person. If the person has relatively negative views about some group, they're going to be more likely to be influenced by automatic stereotype activation. And then finally, another issue has to do with your motivation. A lot of us are influenced by automatic stereotype activation, but we don't want to be. We're motivated to treat people in a fair, egalitarian way. And the more motivated you are, the less likely you are to be influenced by those automatically activated stereotypes. Automatic activation and implicit stereotyping has gotten a lot of attention lately because it can sometimes explain why some innocent black men are shot. There's been some great research conducted with computer simulations. In these simulations, you'll see target people. Sometimes the target people are white, Sometimes the target people are black. Sometimes they're holding a gun like this person here and this person here. And sometimes they're holding something that's completely non-threatening, like a, a wallet or a cell phone or a can of Coke. And the research subjects are put in a situation where they need to decide as quickly as possible if that person is a threat. And if that person is a threat, they should shoot. If the person is not a threat, they should not shoot. Well, in these situations, when the target has a gun, Subjects are much quicker to shoot if the target is black compared to white. And what's really scary is that subjects are also more likely to shoot an unarmed target person if that target person is black rather than white. Well, this research demonstrates an implicit bias, and as such, it's something that's very hard to counteract. But counteracting implicit biases starts with knowing that implicit biases exist. And that fact's been made very clear via social psychological research. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.